Hello, it's Friday morning, and I am here with the, the wonderful and great and brilliant Jody Brar, and we got lots to talk about. Let's talk. Hello, Garland Nixon here with Jody Brar, an absolute expert in Marxism and Leninism and all kinds of stuff. Uh, but we got a lot to talk about today, and we're going to start with this. We're starting with the issue of what we would consider in the United States a constitutional rights, but the basic rights of human beings, the basic rights of people um, to free speech, to um, uh, discuss things that they feel are important, um, and apparently. Um, someone in the broader sphere, um, dare I even say family, has has gone awry of what the uh, imperialists in the UK feel is acceptable behavior. If you could tell us about what happened to your brother, Jody. Sure. Well, it was not only my brother, but my brother oh, okay. definitely has been specifically targeted because I talked to you last time I was with you, I think maybe three weeks ago, about mm -hmm. the fact that four of our party comrades, one of whom was my brother, um, back in November were arrested because they were standing at a stall with lots of books on it and one of the books on it was this book uh, and it's a book about Zionism and they said that this symbol which is not there by accident it's there because it explains a connection between Nazism and Zionism and the connection is both ideological and historical right so there's a reason that symbol is there but we were told that having that symbol on the front of our uh, pamphlet, which, by the way, this pamphlet was published in, let me just look at the day in it, just so I don't get it wrong, 2015. Okay, so it's not a new pamphlet. And the police have seen it on demos, you know, every every few months since then. Several times police have taken copies of it before. So they're well aware of this book, right? But we were targeted and told it was, a, it was potentially an incitement to racial hatred. So what you see is that there's been a political decision that's trying to tarnish the massive and growing Palestine solidarity movement in Britain as anti-Semitic. And to say, and this has been an ongoing campaign, we know across the imperialist world to say all activity that is about Palestine solidarity is inherently anti-Semitic. Opposing Israel is inherently anti-Semitic. Opposing Zionism is inherently anti-Semitic. Of course, we would contend that quite the reverse is true and that's part of the job of this little book here uh, is to explain how zionism is itself an anti-semitic ideology right and a racist ideology and all the rest of it so that's our point the police arrested four of our people that was back in november and it was like i said under the uh, um uh, incitement to racial hatred was the offense that they used to arrest them uh, and they kept them in cells in isolation for 24 hours. They raided their houses in the middle of the night. Uh, you know, it was all very heavy handed. But mainly it was so that they could report in the papers that four people, they didn't say who, they didn't mention our party's name. Four people have been arrested on charges of inciting racial hatred. So that's part of the narrative that they can then publish in the papers. And it's part of, you know, how they report the demonstrations, which they don't talk about the demands of the demonstrators. They don't talk about how many they are. They don't talk about how wide a spectrum of people are there actually. They say, they talk about the policing, they talk about some scuffles the police have with some far right people who turn up to oppose the demonstration. And these are a tiny number compared to the numbers who've come to support Palestine, right? So the demonstrate, the, 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 the reporting is very, very skewed. And it's all about creating a narrative that suits what the, the politicians have been ordered to deliver. You know, so huge pressure coming from the politicians to the police to make arrests to feed this narrative. So there was another big Palestine solidarity demonstration a couple of weeks ago in London. I think it was 13th of January. And um, my brother was there. Now, he had bail conditions that said he's not allowed to hand out any kind of literature and he's not allowed to deviate from the main route of marches, whatever that means. And the other one was, I mean, laughably, he's not allowed to carry swastikas. Make of that what you will, okay? Uh, uh, but anyway, so, but he was at the demonstration with our party comrades. We had a stall, it was a big demonstration, and we were leafleting. We were giving out the same leaflet 
we've been giving out ever since the 7th of October. And I don't have a copy of it with me, I'm afraid. It's nice, it's got a, it's, it's got, it's got a color Palestinian flag on the front with a victory symbol um, to make the V shape of the flag, right? Uh, somebody's hand doing that and it makes the V in the Palestinian flag. And it says victory to the Palestinian people in their, let me just make sure I get it right. Victory to the Palestinian people in their just war for liberation, right? So this is not uh, a new demand for us. The very first leaflet we wrote for our party when it was founded 20 years ago, Garland said, victory to the Iraqi resistance. <laughs> we contend that any people under occupation, any people that's fighting a, against a colonial power for its national liberation um, is on the right side of history and should be supported and particularly has to be supported by the working class in the imperialist country that is oppressing and occupying them. And of course, as we know, the reason, one of the reasons the Palestine Solidarity Movement is so big in Britain is because a lot of British workers understand that Britain has a historical responsibility for the situation and a present day complicity in the horrific genocide that's happening right now. So Britain is very much part of what is going on in Israel or Palestine, depending on how you uh, term it or look at it. Israel is uh, Britain is responsible for founding Israel. Britain is responsible today for arming, supporting uh, Israeli genocide. And all of the major media, all of the mainstream politicians are all united in this because it's a British imperialist endeavor. So we were giving out this leaflet, or our party comrades were giving out this leaflet. I wasn't there. Um, and my brother was there uh, and he was addressing the crowds as they went past and quite a few of them were recognizing him because of the when he was arrested a couple of months earlier and the video of that arrest actually went quite viral and particularly it went viral amongst you know a certain um, section of the of people who were involved in Palestine solidarity work. So a lot of the people who went past were recognizing him and he was talking to them and he was saying to them look I don't have legally I'm not allowed to touch any books or any pamphlets here today or, or any leaflets here today but there's good information over there if you want it and you know this is why we're here and you know he was talking about things like for example our slogan from the river to the sea you know that's been branded as hate speech and we say no this is a call for freedom it's got nothing to do with hating anybody it's to do with supporting the right of the palestinian people to be free in their land right uh, an end to an ethno-supremacist state in the territory from the river to the sea, the territory of historic Par Palestine, um, and for people who live there to live um, as equals in a real, you know, um, democratic society and not an ethno-supremacist state um, based on a crazed uh, supremacist racist ideology and run in an apartheid way. And, you know, of course, no to genocide, right? This is like, that's not really a very shocking demand, is it? But the police had clearly been given orders to build another narrative, which is that support for Palestine resistance is support for terrorism. Hamas, who is one of the, um, one of, the Palestinian resistance organizations, not the only one, just the only one that our mainstream media talk about, not the only one. We support Palestinian resistance as a whole. We don't single out this or that or that, but we say, you know, the Palestinians, the Palestinians chose their leadership. We don't have the right to choose it for them, you know. And over the years, they've had different leaderships in charge. You know, there used to be that the dominant force in Gaza was the PFLP, which is a Marxist Leninist party also banned in Britain, right? So these uh, organizations are classed as terrorist and under the terrorism law, three of our comrades who were leafleting were picked up at the demonstration and taken by the police. Now the police waited, interestingly, they waited until all of the demonstrators had passed and our people were packing up their stall and putting their things away. And then 50 of them came round huge load but they waited until there was no crowd to see them and no one to defend us that if 50 of them came down my brother just quietly walked away as he saw them coming um 
because he didn't want to get caught up a second time while he's still on bail, not particularly. Um, so, and he hadn't been doing anything, right? So he just walked away. Uh, they picked up three people, took them overnight, uh, again, raided their houses, but this time even more heavy handedly because they raided them under anti terror laws, which meant that they turned up in big squads, armed, um, clearing everybody out of the house to make it safe as if they were coming into bomb factories or something. And then what they ended up taking away was printers. Like, it's like they're doing some amazing sleuthing job of tracking down where the leaflet was printed because the leaflet is support for terrorism, right? Well, because um, you couldn't you couldn't possibly, like, go to the local store and buy another printer. You know, they that's a very, very, you know, you'd have to go back to ancient China where they invented printing. And, you know, if you don't have a time machine, a printer's out. Boy, they thwarted the evil uh, people who were printing things by taking the only printers that could possibly be available to them. The only thing is, Garland, I think they thought they were doing some kind of real kind of Sherlock Holmes act by working out the digital signature of where the leaflets had been printed. All the printers they took were black and white and the leaflets in color. And and here's the thing about it. The police. What if you had the print the, the the leaflets in your hand? Nobody's denying that they were printed at some point, and that you were behind printing them. They could have just said, "Hey, where'd you print the printers? I got them printed at the local Kinko store. We have Kinko or something like that. I just went to the local store in the corner and had them all printed. They could are they going to then go to the local store or UPS store or something and arrest everyone in there? From it's. Clearly, it's the, it, it appears to me, this is narrative driven. So they're going to call it, this is a terrorist act, and they're going to act like they were, you know, they're going to go through the motions like they were investigating Al-Qaeda or something so they can yeah. come up with a printer. And here's exhibit A, an HP printer that you could get for 99 bucks at the local store. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, then again, it was reported in the press that, oh, a man from Kent had his house raided by anti-terror police and a woman from so-and-so had a house raided from them. You know, so they so they do this thing, but they in none of these reports do they say, these people were from the CPGBML, this is the leaflet they were giving out, this is the content of the leaflet, right? None of that. So it's, it's reported as if the police have found some suspected terrorists, you know? And of course, as you say, totally narrative driven. So tick, they've done their job of building the narrative and letting the police, letting the media report it. Tick, the media's done their job. So everybody's patting each other on the back. They've done their job of feeding this narrative. The next day, as we had the first time, uh, we sent our comrades to the police station where those arrested were being held uh, to demand their release and to wait for them to come out, obviously, and you know be supportive of them while they were you know, in prison. Um, somebody noticed Ranjit specifically amongst those people outside. Now, bear in mind, he was with his four-year-old son, and he wasn't, his, that wasn't the only child who was with us, right? So we had, there was a bunch of us that outside, and it was very much a kind of family gathering, if you like, not all family, but, you know, family friendly. There was just a bunch of people, party and supporters, and, you know, people waiting uh, for those who were inside the, the police cells. And suddenly, but again, about 10 policemen came, or, and women came rushing down the steps of the police station, surrounded Ranji, grabbed him really violently, as if he was about to do something. He was just stood there with his little boy, right? as if he was about to do something horrific. Uh, um, cuffed him, but you know, with that stuff they do that's really kind of quite painful, very violently, we're, we're sort of... Um, manhandling him in a way where you could see he was kind of quite in distress they were yanking him around and kind of marched him off and they wouldn't even let him stop and check that his five-year-old was with somebody and not about to run into the street right wow. so it was utterly ridiculous again then they took Ranjit in held him for more than 24 hours while they were holding him or held him for 24 hours something like that while they were holding him Again, massive raid on his second raid on his house, right? And they took his printer because there wasn't much else to take. Um, and this whole thing was 100% media narrative, politically driven, had nothing to do with any crimes. What they said was the wording in your leaflet is support for terrorism, support for Hamas. What we realized afterwards was there were spotters from a Zionist it's like a website. It looks like a little innocuous blog, Harry's Place, it's called. 
Uh, but they're very, very active in targeting the Palestine Solidarity Movement. They were on that demonstration. They made repeated posts to the police, adding the Met Police Twitter, right? On Twitter, would you believe, saying, look at this leaflet, it's an offence against the Terrorism Act, look at this wording, that. And then they pictures, and literally the people they took pictures of were the people the police came and arrested. So it was like a set of instructions from these Zionist freelancers to the police. This is the, this is the charge, these are the people. They even put up a map of where our people were stood. This is where they are. It was a whole set of instructions that the Met Police then obediently followed. And you've got to ask yourself, who do the police work for, right? Why are the spotters from what is a, a, ostensibly just a blog, you know, why yeah. are they in orders that the police immediately send 50 people to follow and then raiding four people's houses with squads of armed? I mean, how much did all of that cost, right? And, you know, it, when Ranjit was interviewed, the only thing they could really focus on to justify their charge of you support Hamas, because we don't mention Hamas in our literature, we talk about Palestinian resistance and their right to it. The only thing they could come up with was that the fact that we referred to October 7th as the Alexa flood battle. And they said, that's the same language Hamas uses. That's the language that everybody in the Middle East uses to describe the operation that was launched on the 7th of October by the Palestinian resistance. Well, well how about this? If you had just used the term Al-Aqsa flood, that's the language that Hamas uses. If you had just said the Al-Aqsa flood, nothing more. If you had just had a leaflet that had no other words, it was completely blank, and it had Al-Aqsa flood, nothing else. Couldn't you argue that that's the language that Hamas uses because they say Al-Aqsa flood? If, if you say, I don't know, rain, well, at some point, you know what I mean? The idea that it's the language that they use is, that they use is pretty much absurd um, because you have to show that that language does something or means something. It's kind of that same narrative wherein if Vladimir Putin says it's Tuesday and you say it's Tuesday, they say, oh, you're using uh, Kremlin propaganda because uh, uh, it is Tuesday, true. But Putin said it's Tuesday and you said it's Tuesday. It's that absurd narrative driven thingy they do when they actually have no evidence of wrongdoing. But the the actual wrongdoing um, is a crime against an imperialist narrative. That's really all the re really what it is. It's a crime against an imperialist narrative. Well, I think actually, Garland, there's more to it than that. You know, the, the narrative they're trying to build uh, is at a moment when they're feeling very nervous. You know, simultaneously in the same weekend, there was that, way that, you know, it was another weekend of huge demonstrations all over the world, but particularly big in the imperialist heartlands in Germany, in Britain, in the USA, right? In places where people feel very much that their rulers are complicit with this horrible crime. Um, at the same time as those demonstrations, the ICJ case had just been heard, the case in the International Court of Justice uh, that South Africa brought bringing charges of genocide against Israel and asking for the UN to take an action to stop Israel committing genocide, right? Uh, that was happening at the same weekend and Britain and the US had just bombed Yemen. So I think they were getting very nervous actually about the situation, about the mood of the people, about the way that they were losing control of the narrative and trying to somehow regain control of the narrative. And I, I also think that the, the messages that we have always taken, Garland, as I said, about victory to the resistance, about the right of people to defend themselves uh, against imperialist aggression, are starting to have a much wider audience. There's much more res receptivity to our message. And I think that's one of the reasons we're being targeted, because there's a, there's a real fear that people might start listening to this message in a way that they could let us say anything we wanted before, because no one was really listening to us. But what, now there's a big movement that's actually might be prepared to to engage with our message. I think that that makes us specifically a target. You know, we've got something to, to, to say. We've got knowledge that's that's powerful, actually, if it's connected with all of those people who want to be in support of Palestine.
I think you're right. You know, we have a group and you probably heard of them. It's in, in America. It's small. It's called the African People's Socialist Party. And it's uh, some they come from poor black communities and they do things like like they do things like raise funds to build a recreation center in a poor black community. They have a program where they when people get out of jail, they train them for jobs, you know, things things on the street that they do every day. And of course, they're a socialist group. Of course, they um, are anti-imperialist, et cetera. They run people for office. They get they don't get much, you know, 1.7, 1.8% or whatever of the vote, but they are active, right? And the FBI came after them and like raided them and again, claimed that they were, you know, puppets for the Kremlin, that kind of stuff, right? And, and everybody said, well, they're a very small group and, you know, they're working in poor neighborhoods. What the heck are you doing? I think that it's it gets to what you said. There's a fear that they're being outed. There's a fear because all of the people in the imperialist countries or most of the people in the imperialist countries in the U.S. and U.K. are starting to say, what's going on here? You're not acting in our best, or, you know, acting on our behalf. And they see the people with the revolutionary voice at the forefront saying, hey, we've been trying to tell you all along. This is where this operation is going. This is how things end up. They see the tremendous fear that says people are going to listen, start listening to those who say we've been telling you all along. And, and can explain what's happening and can explain why it's happening and connect it and can connect it to the economic downfall of the imperialist nations. Anyway, your thoughts? Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's there's simultaneously there are attacks on workers at home going on here, Garland, and I'm sure you're seeing the same sort of thing in the States. But, um, you know, ever since the miners were beaten here, the huge one year long miners strike happened 1984 to 85. And uh, it was beaten by the combined forces of, of the state, really, but included not just the Tory government and the judiciary and the police force and all the rest of it, but it also included the Trade Union Congress and the Labour Party. They all helped to defeat the miners. And ever since then, we've had raft after raft of anti-trade union law brought in to essentially create the conditions in which if you abide by the law, any strike you try to run is doomed to fail because no one can support you. You have to ballot this way. You have to you have to conduct yourself this way. The government has the right to inspect how you do everything. I mean, the whole thing is utterly ridiculous. Right. And the whole thing is to hamstring the power of the working class. The only power the working class actually has in a capitalist society where they are essentially the, the wage slaves of the capitalist class, the only uh, meaningful right, the only real power that the working class has is the right to use its collective might to strike for, to withdraw its labour, right, and use that as a tool to try to uh, protect its wages, you know, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, conditions of work, all the rest of it. It's the only power working people have, and the Tory and Labour governments have worked together over the last 40 years to basically take that strike away. Uh, to take that right away. Now we've got the, the most recent piece of, of uh, anti-worker legislation just came into effect. It's called the Minimum Service Levels Bill or something like that Act. And what that does, it's a direct response to the wave of strikes we just saw in the last year, which many of them were in transport and public services, schools, hospitals, um, fire stations, well, uh, railway stations, you know, so they Transport workers, especially uh, nurses and doctors, teachers, and these strikes had the potential to become successful. They were sold out by their own leaderships, but they definitely scared the ruling class because they had the sympathy of the vast majority of ordinary people. People understood why they're striking. They're, they're striking because over the last 30 years, they've basically, you know, watched their wages go, you know, like that in real terms. You know, doctors are still on strike at the moment. They're saying, well, our real terms wages are like 30 percent where they, below where they were like 10 years ago. You know, we actually can't properly sustain ourselves and do our jobs, you know, with pay at this level. And that's the same for teachers. It's the same for nurses. It's the same, you know, for railway workers, the same for a lot of uh people in, in in britain so they brought in this act and 
the trade union movement has responded not by organizing a huge um, campaign, a meaningful like mobilizing people to actually oppose it and you know take action that would force the government to retreat. What they've done is pick a dispute from 40 years ago that was also about trade union rights, but which was won not by a strike, but because the act was reversed when Tony Blair came into office after 12 years of a campaign that didn't get anywhere. And the campaign was to allow the right to unionize for whom? For the spy staff at GCHQ in Cheltenham. So the TUC has picked this as their flagship, remember our great history of victories, but the victory wasn't won by the trade union movement, it was won by a Labour government. So the message is really clear. The message of the TUC is vote Labour, get Keir Starmer in, and he'll repeal this law for us. There's no way Keir Starmer is repealing this law, absolutely no way. And the march that they, the TUC bods are going to have in Cheltenham, which is a really affluent place, by the way. They're having this march in Cheltenham because that's where GCHQ is, right, to commemorate this great moment in working class history. I mean, you couldn't make it up, it's such a joke. It's happening tomorrow and no one will be there. Most working class people won't know about it. There will be some officials from some trade unions there who will all pat each other on the back and say, tick, job done, right? We did our job. We are, we've launched a campaign to defend workers' rights. Meanwhile, the legislation ramps up the workers' rights are going down the toilet, pay and conditions are going down and down. So you can see why it is that, you know, the state, on the one hand, it does everything it can to control people. On the other hand, it's very nervous because they're increasingly angry. Um, let me ask you this, Mike, uh, curious. I've been reading about, you know, okay, people are upset with the Tories, etc. They look like they're going to, the next election, they'll lose in a blowout and Labour will win. And, you know, to me, it's six and six and as they say, six in one hand, half a dozen in the other. Right. The, what are your thoughts on the state of British politics wherein? I mean, I'm looking at it. I'm like, what? Why would anybody even bother to go to the polls and vote to replace whatever clown the Tories are going to have with Keir Starmer? He's really going to take things in a different direction. Your thoughts on the state of British politics again? We got Biden and Trump and Biden's so bad, Trump looks less dangerous than Biden, which it's not hard to look less dangerous than Biden. But anyway, your thoughts on the state of the imperial kind of log jam in politics where you've got a couple of different parties that are trying to convince the voters that they're somehow different from each other? You know, it's a really good question. And my perspective is a bit different. I don't see this what you guys you guys refer to having the uniparty don't you right. over there the republicans and the democrats you can't distinguish between them it's the uniparty they are the establishment and between them they make sure that the capitalist rule is firmly in place and the agenda stays the same no matter who you vote for well the truth is garland we have that here too and it's not new the truth is that the very first labor government in 1924 wanted to prove, and they actually said this, the leader, um, Ramsay MacDonald, actually said he wanted to prove to the imperialists that the empire was safe in our hands, right? They were suppressing Indians, they were gassing the Kurds in Iraq, they were, I think they were bombing Iraq, they did all kinds of, they only had a government for about eight months, the first one, they committed a whole bunch of colonial crimes in order to prove their worthiness to be allowed to be the main party of opposition, because basically they were in the they were in the process of displacing the liberals as the main party of British opposition. But what they made clear from the very outset was they weren't socialist, they weren't Marxist, they were loyal British subjects, loyal to British imperialism first and foremost. And there's a lot of historical reasons for that. They represent actually the section of the British working class. What, lay, what Lenin called the labor aristocracy, right? The section which benefits from crumbs from the imperialist table. And therefore, because it's it has better pay and conditions and living standards than the mass of the working class, it considers itself superior to them. It identifies it, it's the source of its privilege as the system. It's very, very loyal to the system. And you only have to look at, you know, Tony Blair and Keir Starmer to, uh, you know, to see how, you know, the labor, leaders can be more vicious 
against the working class at home and more desperate to wage wars abroad actually than a lot of Tories who were always are always held up, held up to us as kind of proto-fascists, you know, oh my God, the Tories, the Tories, the Tories. And like again, if you look at the TUC's page about their their campaign to defend the right to strike, it goes on and on about how it's a Tory attack on workers. They never point out that in all the years of Labour government, Tony Blair and then Gordon Brown, it was like how many years was that 12 years or something, they never did anything to overturn any of the anti-trade union laws that had been passed. Instead, they did lots and lots of more anti-worker things, right? So the idea that, you know, labor is our salvation, it's been pushed on us really, really hard for, for you know, a hundred years, and it's simply never been true. What is changing, I think, in, the, in, the, in recent times is, again, since the miners' strike, with the return of overproduction crisis to the imperialist world uh, and the need, on the one hand, the need to attack the working class and the, and the benefits they got after World War II in order to bring back profitability and, and make profits out of public services that they were you know, just doing for free. Uh, and on the other hand, um, the feeling that you know, with the Soviet Union going and then gone, they're, they're, they didn't have the same threat of socialism and, and an organized working class hanging over them. Um, so the ruling class has been attacking pay and conditions and the deindustrialization of many parts of Britain. Uh, many, many uh, communities have been left with nothing. And now you're looking at kind of third generation, you know, uh, communities where they're riddled with unemployment and drug addiction and everything else that goes with deep poverty and decline, right? And so, What's different is that large numbers of working class people have learned through their own bitter experience that there's no difference between Tory and Labour because they were always told and they and they loyally did what they'd been taught to vote Labour because you're working class, vote Labour because it's the Labour Party that will take care of you. Right? So but for 40 years, they've been under attack and they've been under attack by Tory and Labour governments. And, you know, Labour MPs, you know, in these areas that used to be the red wall of Britain, right, there were Labour MPs, Labour councillors, Labour everything. And as they went into deep decline, those Labour MPs and councillors didn't fight for a book in a library, never mind a job or a factory or a piece of infrastructure or anything else that would have, you know, helped the communities to, to, to defend themselves against what was happening. So this... Uh, crisis of legitimacy for the Labour Party in particular is something that's a growing phenomenon. How at the moment how that um, shows itself is that larger and larger numbers of people of the poor section of the working class don't vote. They've disengaged from the electoral process and it's not because as it's called they're stupid or they're apathetic, it's because they know damn well that it will make no difference to them. You know, the, the ICJ ruling um, went to came down this morning and um, I'm going to have to get, as I've said, I need to get, I have a person I'm talking to a little later today as an international human rights attorney to get a, a true interpretation of it. You know, right now people are guessing it means this, it's good, it's bad, it's not enough, whatever. But I want to see what an ICJ, excuse me, what, what, what an actually a specialist in it has. Dan Kovalik, I don't know, a lot of people have heard from him, great revolutionary guy. Um, but at any rate, um, but everything now is tied to that conflict. What happened to the members of your party that were arrested tied to the conflict? Um, the UK joining in with um, the uh, US imperialists to bomb Yemen, the defense at all cost of this project, um, when the people of both, it's clear the majority of the people of most countries are in opposition to this. The a Democratic Party here, 75, 80% of the party now want a ceasefire. Your thoughts on the importance, why is it that this particular conflict that's supporting this, um, this, this, the, the, uh, Israel's actions are so important that the, um, the imperialists, the US and UK imperialists are, are risking everything. They're risking their countries falling apart. They're risking their parties falling. They are falling apart. Why is it so important to them to maintain support for this project in defiance of their constituents and risking 
really everything at home. You know, we've talked about this before that, you know, Israel is not about Jewish people. Israel is about the control of the resources of the Middle East. And of course, the primary resource of the Middle East that people are really interested in, or monopoly capitalists are really interested in, is oil. Oil is still the fundamental primary commodity in the world market. It has been for more than 100 years now. And controlling oil, not only making sure that you have access as an imperialist power to uh, as limitless oil for as cheap as possible to fuel your industry and your war machines, but being able to deprive, to cut off oil to your rivals, to your opponents, to anybody you want to punish. Um, so the, the geopolitical, the strategic importance for the imperialist powers of controlling the flows of oil and being able to loot oil at rock bottom prices and not have to pay for the market you know dollars per barrel for it um this is a primary you know goal of of the imperialists if they want to maintain their dominant position in the world and so that's why israel was put where it was put and the palestinians had the bad luck to be underneath that place right so they have suffered particularly but the palestinian cause is is not just about palestinians if you see what i mean you know for many people they see it as as a kind of oh it's nasty what's being done to palestinian people and it is truly horrific because of course the the founding ideology of israel zionism uh, is a supremacist racist ideology and it, it, it built into it is the concept of ethnic cleansing. Everybody else is, is a non-human. Only the Jews are real people. Everybody else is a non-person. And they're just in the way they have to be got rid of. And, you know, let's start quoting bits of the Old Testament and recalling the Amalek and whatever. I mean, you know, it's you if you saw it, you'd think it was a spoof. You know, some of the things that Israeli politicians today say uh, as just part of everyday uh, speech. But, you know, this was the to have an overt polity that speaks this way was the logical conclusion of the founding of Israel. Israel was founded in genocide. It was always a genocidal mission, right? The Palestinians were in the way. We just got to clear them out. You know, it was bad luck for them that they founded it at a time where um, uh, colonized peoples were no longer prepared to put up with the way that the colonizers treat them and just you know the, the palestinians couldn't be shunted into other arab territories and just become you know syrians and iraqis and egyptians and you know jordanians and whatever they were like no we're palestinians and we have a right to be in palestine and israel has never been able to find a solution to that because there is no solution to that under zionism zionism says this territory is ours you're in the way bugger off right it hasn't worked but the thing is it's a it's a long ongoing cross so so for the to answer your question why is it so important why do they give up so much because losing the middle east is like it's like being absolutely it's like hitting the iceberg if you're in the titanic right it's such a blow to imperialism from which i don't think imperialism would really recover right and US imperialism now is the chief imperialist power. The others are all hanging on the coattails. The whole system, you know, would be hold and, and sinking fast if they lost their ability to control the resources of the Middle East. So it's a life and death struggle for them. It's not a small thing. The problem is they have been building the conditions for their destruction over the last century. And ultimately, it's not surprising that those conditions have come to fruition. The resistance forces have been growing. They've been learning. They've been mastering the use of media and all kinds of other weapons, legal weapons, as well as the use of an organization of force armed resistance uh, and building up the forces necessary to face down imperialism in the region. And what we're noticing now is there's a there's a tipping point come. And a lot of us didn't necessarily notice it happen. But now you take a step back and look at all the various forces. You look at how steel the Yemenis have become over nearly 10 years of fighting a proxy war. Again, they've been fighting British and American imperialism, but through the proxy of Saudi Arabia and the UAE that made it unclear to a lot of people who was really whose war was it really, you know? And um, 
you know, the, the resistance forces in South Lebanon, Hezbollah, um, the resistance forces all across Iraq, the Syrian Arab army, you know, these are all now forces, and of course Iran, which you can't forget. But Iran, you know, Iran is definitely the strongest part of the of the axis of resistance in the Middle East. Of course it is. It's a state with state power and state capabilities. But it's not the owner of the axis of resistance. The others are not its proxy forces. They are allies in a common struggle. And they have understood that it's a common struggle. And because of that, they coordinate with each other and help each other. But I'm sure there are other forces around the world that have also helped the, the people in this region learn the art of underground warfare, for example, how to build really good tunnels, how to make weapons when you can't, don't have electricity and you don't have modern factories. And, you know, there are many resistance movements around the world which have experience of this, which have, let's not forget, the Koreans and the Vietnamese both fought it using tunnel warfare in similar conditions of low technology you know they lost huge numbers of people but they beat us imperialism even in its heyday when it comes to asymmetrical warfare the key is the people and um, this is something the palestinians have and the mass of the and you know increasingly palestine and now yemen are uniting the region around them in terms of the masses and this is a power that the imperialists ultimately will not be able to defeat i i believe if we could comment um got a few minutes left on the conflict in ukraine you know one of the things that they uh you know you'll see in the in the in the newspapers of here and in, in britain the russians imperialist invasion and i'm like we got 850 bases and they're the imperialist right i firmly believe that the world changed. Certainly, the you know the world changed after October seventh, but the world changed after the uh, the Russian uh, Russians entered the the ongoing conflict in um, eastern Ukraine. I do believe that it's very important. I noticed that there was an Af uh, uh, a Russian African summit, and within a week or two after that summit, the Africans started revolting and throwing the French out. Um, I think that there was something about a like a, a match that was lit then um that spread that, that you know the a fire was started you know your thoughts on the people who are arguing oh the russians are imperialists and they're doing imperialist things uh, versus my position that i believe that it's anti-imperialism i believe um let me add this now president putin's supposed to be going to north korea i just read today that i think now there's a chinese delegation in north korea they're bringing in north korea back into the fold they're recognizing that you know the imperialist attack on north korea that some of them went along with in the un and things like that 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 was an area error anyway your thoughts ukraine north korea china all those things all the things um <laughs> you know you're absolutely right garland that um, the launch of Russia's SMO back in February 2022, gosh, it's nearly two years now. It's amazing, isn't it? Uh, it was a tipping point in the, in history, really. It moved us into a kind of a new era. And it's an era that's characterized on the one hand by deepening imperialist economic crisis and an accelerating imperialist drive to war but on the other hand, by a rising tide of resisting class struggle all over the world. And it drew a line around the world also in terms of pick a side. Now, the imperialists have for years been softening up the kind of intelligentsia in their own countries by describing their main opponents, Russia and China, as imperialist. Why do they do that? Because they know that fundamentally imperialism is looked on as a bad thing, even by uh, the people in the imperialist countries themselves. They don't like the colonial history of direct occupation of lands. They, they realized that was wrong and bad and unjust. Why do they realize it was wrong and bad and unjust? Actually, they realize that because of the Soviet Union, because the October Revolution unleashed the, uh, the, the consciousness of national liberation onto the world and really made it no longer possible for anyone to justify overtly 
the way the the way the Zionists try to now, and everyone goes what, and is horrified. They talk the way all imperialists used to talk like 150 years ago. Right? The problem is now it's not actually acceptable. You're not supposed to do that in public where people can hear you. You have to do it behind closed doors. I've no doubt that that's how the imperialists all still believe and think behind closed doors. But in front of people, they have to talk the language of human rights and democracy and respect and equality and all this crap that has absolutely nothing to do with their system. But they have to because it's the desire of the masses. The mass of the people around the world want those things. And those things actually come with socialism. <laughs> they came with the Soviet Union and they came as a result of everything that happened after the October Revolution. But they have this propaganda that says Russia's imperialist and aggressive. China's imperialist and aggressive. And we have to defend ourselves against this aggression by ringing them with bases. <laughs> they haven't taken their soldiers anywhere, but we have to ring them with bases uh, because they're aggressive imperialists. Right? So this is their propaganda. And what's shocking, actually, to me is the way that so many on the left in the imperialist countries echo that propaganda, echo it, repeat it, find justifications for it, find pseudo Marxist kind of terminology and quotes from Lenin, you know, to 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 kind of sanctify what is essentially aggressive pro-war, warmongering, warmongering propaganda from our ruling classes. You know, the the the, the characteristic, actually, of the war um, being fought in Ukraine on the part of the people of the Donbass and the Russians who've gone in in their support is that they're anti-fascist, self-defense, national liberation. Uh, that is the characteristic of that war. That makes it a just war for those people. It's an unjust war on the side of imperialism, which is aggressively, um, it, number one, it's taken over Ukraine and turned its people into its proxy armies and its territory into its into its uh, uh, battlefield. Um, and number two, it is aggressively using Ukraine to try to destroy Russia. So Russia's in the right of it, and uh, the USA and its allies are in the wrong. And let's never forget that it's the USA's war, it's the imperialist war, it's NATO's war. It's not Ukraine's war. Ukraine's people have been horrifically uh, treated, brutalized. Their country has been destroyed. Their, a generation of their men has been destroyed. I've heard, seen figures that say a million uh, Ukrainians have been killed. And then let's assume that means there's been like two million casualties on top of that, you know, severe casualties. That's horrific. You know, there's no way back to the status quo ante from that. And so, you know, this idea that Russia was aggressing when it finally came in to support the, the Russians who were defending themselves in the Donbass against a, a, something, I mean, much more slow motion, but the ideology with which NATO has mobilized its proxies in Ukraine is a fascist supremacist ideology, just like we see its proxies in Israel use when, they, when they're carrying out their ethnic cleansing and genocide against Palestinians. They say Russians are uh, um, untermenschen. Um, they say uh, everything about Russian, Russian culture and language must be wiped out, taken off the map. Uh, you know, if Russians aren't prepared to live as second class citizens, they have to be wiped out exactly the same way that the Israelis talk about the Palestinians. They were building or trying to build an apartheid state, ethno supremacist apartheid state in Ukraine. That would be a proxy for the USA. Exactly the same that the imperialists did with Israel. Right. So there's a lot of parallels there. And the line that is drawn around the world, you're right. It electrified the world that Russia finally came in and stood up for the Russians there and turned the tide of that war, you know. And in fact, when the Russians came in, again, they were provoked to it. They were forced to it, you know, because troops were massing. Ukrainian troops were massing at the borders of the Donbass, the Donbass, which had liberated itself and had defended itself for eight years already. So this war, as you said, was ongoing. It had been being fought for eight years, ever since the coup uh, replaced the last elected government of Ukraine with an imposed uh, you know, fascist regime 
that was basically put in place by NATO, and they called that the Maidan Revolution or whatever they called it. But it's basically a fascist coup enacted by the USA to put its proxies in power. And since that date, um, the regions in the East that said, no way are we settling for a fascist regime that's coming to, that's targeting us specifically, um, they fought back, they liberated their area, and then they fought in defense of it. And they had beaten the Ukrainian army several times, uh, and they got all their equipment from the Ukrainian army, actually, as far as I've understood. Um, they were fighting heroically, but it's a small area, and you know, NATO was pouring in weapons and training to the Ukrainian army, uh, and the Ukrainian army had been busy building huge um, defense lines, you know, massive trenches and fortifications. Now, it's clear they were not doing that to fight the people of the Donbass. They were preparing for a war against Russia. And the next stage of that was that uh, in, in the end of January, no, beginning of February, just before the launch of the SMO, those few days before the launch, when we were getting this huge media campaign that says, Russia's going to invade Ukraine. And we we're all thinking, why would Russia invade Ukraine? I'm a bit, um, what's that all about? What was actually happening was Ukrainian troops were massing at the border of Donbass about to launch a big offensive and try and, you know, do a do a full um, invasion. And that was when Russia finally realized all the promises the West has made about peace are worth nothing. And they've only been using the peace process as an excuse, as a as buying time to build up their forces in order to be more effective in a war. And the war is actually not just aimed against its own people in the east it's aimed against us and that was when russia acted but by acting and by withstanding nato withstanding uh, western economic sanctions withstanding nato's military pressure uh what that did was truly electrify the oppressed of the world who have been struggling away in their you know separate spheres for so many years you know the the, the 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 uprising you talked about in Sahel did not come out of nowhere. That's been that's an ongoing struggle of the people for decades, but it acquired a new vitality and 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 um, confidence off the back of what was happening. What they were seeing was happening to the Western powers because the in the process of fighting their war against Russia and Ukraine, one of the things the the, the West has done to itself is expose its weaknesses. Yes, I, I, I certainly agree with you. And I think that um, the reality is that uh, it's exposed its weaknesses ideologically um, in its ability to control the narrative and to create a viable narrative. The narratives have become so absurd now that people are, you know, kind of like laughing at it, not really laughing because it's dangerous, but you get my point, discounting the narratives um, and militarily. You know, let me say this, the last thing. One thing, I, uh, uh, there, there are so many things in common with these two conflicts, uh, the Ukraine conflict and the, and the, and the one in, in the Middle East. One being, it's obvious that the Russians knew for a long time that this was coming and they had been preparing a lot of things, either knowing it was coming or in case it was coming, right? It is also apparent that the resistance has, whether they knew it was coming or not, has been preparing themselves. When you look at Yemen, Yemen had no, you know, little weapons, little defense. And now they have, um, they've been able to, and this is an interesting thing. Uh, well, okay, let me put it to you like this. The U.S. empire's huge, as they say, blue water navy, right? And that is to control the, the, the worldwide choke points, international commerce on the seas, right? And of course, two of the most important, there are a number of choke points we could talk about, but two critical ones are the Bob el Mandab Strait and Straits of Hormuz. And a very, the, the, the weakest power, theoretically, in um, the weakest, I guess, state power in um, the Middle East and one of the weakest state powers in the world has proven that because of their geographic location, that they can thwart the the, the um, machinations of a gigantic world, all world encompassing empire. How important is what Yemen is doing in demonstrating that people who appear not to have a power and not to have much power can use a little bit of military power 
um, a they're they're on the air more public relations power. They're being interviewed, and of course their geographic location. They can use the things they have to thwart this gigantic nuclear empire. And that'll be the the last question. I think it's hugely important, Garland, and I think it's again it's electrified the region and much of the world. You know, many people who weren't paying attention to Yemen, even Palestinians, have admitted we weren't paying attention to Yemen. We didn't understand they were in the same struggle as us. But the Yemenis have made it clear that they understood they were in the same struggle as the Palestinians. They understood that the enemy is US imperialism. And in the region, US imperialism's number one proxy is Israel. They understood that Zionism and US imperialism are the major enemies of all the struggling peoples. <laughs> hey, beautiful hat. Of all the struggling peoples of the Middle East. And by doing that, they've taught such an important lesson in anti-imperialism. You know, they might do it in the language of religion, but they are teaching the best communists around the world, uh, the best freedom fighters around the world, the lessons of anti-imperialist solidarity. Absolutely, as you say, you know, it's not, if you've got, if you can organize the people with determination, you can win. And the fact that the USA cannot gun them down, cannot destroy, they've spent 10 years trying to destroy this movement, Ansarallah, and what is now the Yemeni main government uh, with Ansarallah at its heart. They've spent 10 years trying to destroy the Yemeni quest for independence and sovereignty. And all they've done, I mean, they've massacred huge numbers of Yemenis, particularly by cholera and starvation. I mean, if we think the genocide we're looking at in Gaza right now is horrific, because we're seeing it in real time in front of our eyes, nobody was looking when a, a genocide on a far larger scale was being conducted against Yemen. Yemen bore it all. And it's come through stronger, steeled, organized, prepared. And like every resistance movement in the Middle East has been preparing for the day when it has to face off against the USA. But the Yemenis have been facing off the USA for 10 years. They've got, they're like, we've got nothing else to lose. But this is our war too. We are not going to stand by while you murder our Palestinian brothers and sisters. And they've shown that they have real power. Now, this is a lesson to everybody because the truth is, especially in the imperialist countries, any country which is complicit in Israel's crimes has a workforce that is helping in that complicity, right? We're making weapons. We're moving them. We're allowing Israeli goods in and out of our ports. Why are not? Why is not every docker around the world saying no Israeli goods in or out of this port? Why is not every arms manufacturer saying no weapons for Israel will be made or shipped from here? Why is not every train driver saying no uh, Israeli goods or um, weapons will be transported by us? You know, it's in the end the imperialists don't fight their wars; we fight them. The working class fights them. Yemen is reminding us that we ultimately have the say over what happens in the world if we learn how to organize ourselves to use it. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that's the critical thing that we're learning from Yemen, and that is that the power is in your determination. You know, the U.S., it, it's interesting because the, the empire is like, OK, well, doggone it, we'll show them we're going to bomb them. And of course, the two you know, imperial powers of the last few centuries. We're coming in and they come in and they bomb Yemen with the concept that their mentality, well, that scares people, that upsets people. And the Yemen, the, 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 the not just the government, the people of Yemen take to the streets by the millions and they say, hooray, we've been waiting for this fight. This is what we're looking for. We've been waiting all this time. We finally get to confront the puppeteers instead of the puppets and everything they do um, the you know again the worst thing the most horrible fear for the imperialist is an example you know an example of China a country that doesn't do what they say you have to do to be economically successful there's economic success the um, example of the people that say we're not afraid of your planes and bombs you can bomb us and attack us all you want to we're going to fight back anyway oh uh, the you know the 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 revolutionary that fights back because that's who they are and that's what not what they do rather than says we can be afraid or intimidated and i think the the russians who said get off our border or we'll fight you the 
people of Yemen who say, stop committing a genocide or we'll fight you, that don't say we're afraid of the outcome, but that just say, hey, look, we're going to stand up against this and fight. I think that's a horrifying example for the imperialists, because if everyone starts to do that, then they get overwhelmed. And the worst case scenario is if their own citizens, who they no longer have any connection to whatsoever, look at that exterior example and say, well, my gosh, we're not happy with these same people. Maybe we can, as you said, stop transporting, do a, some kind of a strike or something, Jody. Absolutely. And the, the fact is that the one thing that workers need to make their power count is organization. And you know, against the power of, of, of big capital, you know, they pay for a whole state machinery that's very repressive, but ultimately we have the numbers. But our numbers only count if we're organized. You know, the Yemeni people, they've got so little, you know, in terms of uh, the resources available to them after 10 years of war and everything they've taken and how this country's been really bombed, um, you know, into the ground. But they have organized themselves through that time. They are able to make their numbers count, to make their power count. And that's a lesson that our rulers have understood better than we have. We as workers have allowed our organizations to be destroyed by work, by ruling class uh, co-optation, infiltration, suppression, you know, various means they've used in different parts of the world, different types of organizations. Uh, but they have effectively been destroyed. And the, the key for victorious resistance against the power of capital is reorganizing ourselves. Jody Brar, where can people find all of your information? Where can they find further and follow you and things of that nature? So down here is my URL, thecommunists.org. I'm the editor of that website. Um, if you just uh, look for me personally, uh, I'm Jody Bra on Telegram. And my party is the communists on telegram and you can find everything from there we also have a youtube channel called proletarian tv wonderful thank you very much and thanks everyone gotta run um but make sure that you um follow jody and support her um also uh we'll be hopefully back any friday that she can be here we'll have her on it's always open for her friday mornings at 9 a.m um, and of course, share this on all your social media platforms. You know, I have been thrown off of Twitter for, it's interesting. The first time I was thrown off Twitter, it was because I made a text, uh, excuse me, I made a comment on um, a thread from Anthony Blinken. And I said that something about he wanted to kill Palestinians. That was what I said, that he like personally would strangle him with his bare hands if he could get away with it. Isn't it interesting? That's the first time I got thrown off of Twitter. How prophetic. All right. Thanks a lot, Jody Brar. Thanks a lot, everyone. Don't forget um, your, uh, your all your social media platforms, especially Twitter, X, whatever it is. Since I'm not on there, I'm going to count on you to make sure that you guys get this out. Thanks a lot, everybody. I'm out.